In this video, we're going to use a meaningful real world example to derive the equation for a new set of functions, which we've not seen before, called the hyperbolic trigonometric functions or the hyperbolic trig functions. So these are new functions. They're not the trig functions, but they kind of look like the trig functions. And so we borrow their names. So our model, our physical model, is to take a chain or a cable and hang it between two poles. And we'd like to find the equation of the shape made by the chain. So I haven't even put in a coordinate system yet, but let's just look at what the physical model looks like. I have the ground here is the red line, the two green lines represent the poles, and then this blue curve represents the shape of the chain. Now, I want to give you a little bit of warning here. There's going to be a lot of physics and vectors going on here, so it helps to follow the exposition uh, if you know something about vectors and then something about physics. But if not, stay calm. It's okay. I just want to show you, even if you can't follow all of the steps, that in the end, the equation of this chain, it kind of looks like a parabola, but it's not. It's something very different. And uh, so I want to show you or tell you that um, these new functions are not just mathematical constructions, but they are applied to real world applications. So just do the best to follow it. And again, all I'm trying to do is show you that these new functions actually have meaningful interpretations. So let's take a look at what we have here. I am going to take uh, A to be the lowest point on the chain. And I'm going to take another point P somewhere else on the chain. And it's just going to be easier if I choose a point on the right hand side. And I'm going to look at this portion of the chain going from A to B to P, point P, from point A to point P. And I say, well, let me use the letter S to represent its length. And I'm going to assume the chain is made from the same material throughout. So it weighs so many kilograms per meter. That's what we call the linear density. And we're going to use the Greek letter mu uh, to represent that density. And so the mass of that chain would be mu times the length. So if this were a chain that weighed two kilograms per meter and it were 10 meters long, then its mass would be two times 10 or 20 kilograms. So it's just that linear density times the length gives me the mass. And that tells me that the weight is the mass times the acceleration of gravity. Uh, so force equals ma there. So the weight of the chain is pulling the chain down and then, or this portion of the chain, let's just focus on this portion of the chain. And then the rest of the chain up here is pulling that portion of the chain up. And it's also pulling it a little bit to the right, which means that down here, this portion of the chain, the rest of the chain is pulling it to the uh, left. And so the chain is in equilibrium, meaning that it's not moving. It just hangs there. And so that means all the forces on this curve from A to P have to be balanced. In other words, this force that's pulling up and to the right has to be pulling with the same force as the combination of this force to pulling to the left and the weight pulling it down. 
So since the weight is going straight down and the force at the bottom of the chain is pulling straight to the left, I'd like to rewrite this force as the sum of two forces, one which is going straight up and one which is going straight right. Those are called the horizontal and vertical components of that force. And so uh, just a little note here to be very clear that uh, uh, the T without the arrow is the magnitude of that force. So the, the force without the uh, any direction implied. And so, uh, and to be careful, I should have left the arrow off this triangle here, but that's fine. Um, so I just use this letter. This is the Greek letter uh, C. So this is People pronounce this in different ways. Some people just say psi. Um, and some people actually pronounce the P, which is what I'm going to do and say psi. Um, I'm probably pronouncing it wrong, but it's a habit that I'm having a hard time breaking. So, um, but just using some basic triangle trig, that means that this vertical leg of this right triangle could be written as t times the sine of c. And uh, the horizontal would be t cosine of c. So now I have equilibrium in this sense that the force that's pulling to the left at the bottom has to equal to t cosine of c. And the weight, which is pulling down, has to be equal to t times sine of c. So let me write those two out. I can replace the weight with, remember that, mu times the length times the acceleration of gravity. And so if I divide those two, oh, I'm sorry, if I divide the blue by the yellow, I'll get tangent of c equals mu times g times s over t naught. Now remember t, t squared is the same as t squared times sine squared c plus cosine squared c because sine squared plus cosine squared gives me one. So if I distribute the t squared, I could write that as t sine c squared plus t cosine c squared. But I have an expression for t sine c. t sine c is just mu s g. And t cosine c is t naught. So now to, we have a lot of constants going around. So we're going to replace the expression t naught over mu g with the letter A. So A is just a new constant, uh, which is this ratio of these other constants. And so now our expression is a little bit simpler. Tangent of C is just the length over this new constant A, or the length can be written as A times tangent of C. And then T naught we can rewrite in terms of a, that would be mu times g times a. And so making that substitution into our Pythagorean formula over here, that gives me t as mu times g radical x squared plus a squared. And s is a times tangent of C. So if you uh, think of this, um, I really now have uh, an equation or a pair of equations which describe the curve. 
but it really is not what I'm looking for. I'd really like to have something that y, that says y equals a function of x to really get an understanding of this curve. So let's take this system of equations and do a little bit more work to it. So note over here at this point p that the derivative, if I have a coordinate system, that the derivative, no matter where I put the origin, the derivative dy dx is going to be the tangent of this angle c. And we said that that equals s over a in our previous slides. And so we're going to do a little bit of a preview. We're going to study arc length in general, but just a quick preview of how do we calculate arc length, meaning the length of this curve from a to p. So if I have a curve, this little red curve here, I want to calculate its length. Well, if this is really small, for this analysis, I'm going to say that this is a really tiny piece of curve. I'm going to just go ahead and replace its length with the length of the secant line. And because it's small, I'll call it delta s. And so delta s can be, uh, I can break this down as a right triangle with a delta y and delta x as the length. So the length of the red curve is about delta s if this red curve is really tiny. And delta s squared is delta x squared plus delta y squared. So if I divide every term by delta x squared, I get this expression. And I can solve that for delta s over delta x equaling radical 1 plus the fraction delta y over delta x in parentheses squared. Now in the limit, then uh, delta s over delta x becomes ds over dx. And delta y over delta x becomes dy over dx. And so this expression ds by dx equals radical 1 plus the fraction dy dx squared uh, is true for any curve. But now for this particular curve that we're studying, we also know that dy dx, we just wrote that up here, that dy dx is s over a. And now if I were to take the derivative of both sides of that equation with respect to x, I would get the second derivative of y with respect to x is going to be 1 over a times ds dx. Now I just found an expression for ds by dx. So let's go ahead and make that substitution. This Leibniz notation is sometimes useful, but at this point it's a, a little bit cumbersome. So let's switch back to the prime notation. So now I have a differential equation. a times y double prime equals radical 1 plus quantity y prime squared. So the solution to that differential equation is going to be the equation of that curve. So now the only thing that's left is to find a solution to that differential equation. And we're going to do that by first making a change of the variables. We're going to let u equal y prime. So then u prime is y double prime. I still get a differential equation here, but I think that we're going to be able to solve this. This says that a times du dx equals 1 plus, I'm sorry, 1 plus u squared under the radical sign. Or dx equals du over radical 1 plus u squared. Now we just learned about the inverse tangent, uh, inverse sine, inverse cosine, inverse secant. None of their derivatives, even though it looks like that, none of their derivatives 
is uh, 1 over radical 1 plus u squared. So we still have to do some more work. So let's review. We made a u substitution. We got this differential equation in u. And we're using this technique of that we used before with our exponential growth e examples, where we separate the variables. So we bring the dx over here. We write this as a times du over radical one, uh, radical one plus u squared. And I'd like to be able to integrate both sides. And to find a solution, I'm going to do something we've done many times before, and we're going to do many times in the future in this class, is I am going to draw a triangle that has a 1 plus u squared. So the difference is that now I'm starting with 1 plus u squared. Since this is 1 plus u squared, this looks like something that would come out from the Pythagorean theorem, where the leg is 1, and the other leg is u, and then the hypotenuse would be radical 1 plus u squared. I'll use theta for the angle then uh, between the hypotenuse and the adjacent side. And I'm going to make a substitution. I'm going to say, hey, in this triangle, u is actually tangent theta. And du is secant squared theta, d theta. And secant squared theta is actually hypotenuse over adjacent, so 1 over cosine. So it'll be radical 1 plus u squared. So in this expression, I can replace du with secant squared theta d theta. I can replace 1 plus I mean, radical of 1 plus u squared with secant of theta. I guess I could have got that secant of theta by also just replacing uh, u with tangent of theta and applying the identity that 1 plus tangent squared theta equals secant squared theta. So making those substitutions and then taking the integral of both sides, I would come up with x equaling the uh, constant a times the antiderivative of secant of theta, which we already found. We found that the antiderivative of secant of theta is the natural log of the absolute value of secant of theta plus tangent of theta plus c. Now, we're going to go ahead and assume that secant of theta plus tangent of theta um, is going to give it's going to be a uh, positive number. Let's just see if that makes sense. Uh, that would be u plus 1 plus radical u squared. And sure enough, that sum um, should always be a positive number. So I don't need the absolute value signs. And now, in order to uh, figure out what my constant c is, I'm going to go ahead and put in a, a, a coordinate system. I really don't need the x-axis here. I drew it here um, just for completeness, but that's really not going to be or necessarily going to be the final uh, place where I put my x-axis. But I'm definitely going to situate my y-axis right here in on the symmetry line of this hanging chain. And the reason why I do that is because then uh, at this low point on the chain, at point A, x will equal 0. No matter where I put the x-axis, x equals 0. And the tangent line at that low point is going to have a slope of 0. So that would, the tangent line slope would be y prime is 0 at x equals 0. And that means that uh, I'm going to get my uh, constant of integration c equal to 0. Good. So now I have 
x over a equals the natural log of u plus radical 1 plus u squared. Let's re rewrite that in exponential form. That would say u plus radical 1 plus u squared equals e to the power of x over a. So that already gives me possibly another differential equation uh, that maybe I could try to solve for y. But to get there, we're going to find it's going to be easier if I do a little bit of algebra first. And what I'm going to do is multiply both sides by the conjugate of u plus radical 1 plus u squared. And when I do that and simplify, I get, well, u squared minus quantity 1 plus u squared. Well, that's just going to be negative 1 equaling e to the power of x over a times u minus radical 1 plus u squared. Or I could rewrite this as, well, let me divide both sides. Let me show a little bit more work here. I'm going to divide both sides by e to the power of x over a. Now 1 over e to the power of x over a, I can write that as e to the power of negative x over a. And then I still have the minus sign there. So if I put these two together then, if I put together my original equation with this second equation here, it's going to give me a system of equations where it's going to be a lot easier to solve this for u. So I can go ahead and solve this for u by adding these two equations together. So 2u is going to be e to the x over a minus e to the negative x over a. Or u is 1 half times the quantity e to the power of x over a minus e to the negative power of x over a. Now, I still haven't found an equation in terms of y. That Remember, u is y prime. So I know that uh, y prime is 1 half e to the x over a minus negative x over a. And so I can take the antiderivative of both sides. And I'll need to make a u substitution here to be able to evaluate these integrals. And I'll come up with the expression that y equals 1 half a in brackets e to the power of x over a plus now, there's a plus because this has a, the second term, original second term had a negative exponent. So when I take the antiderivative, I'll get a negative times a negative making a positive plus some constant of integration. And now I am going to say that we're going to choose the location of the x-axis to make c equal to 0. So it uh, may not be the location that I, I drew it here. But we're going to say in order to find an equation, we have to choose an origin. We're going to choose the most convenient origin, which means that we're going to choose the y-axis to be the axis of symmetry, and the x-axis is going to be located to make this value of c equal to 0. And if we choose a equal to 1, the most simplest value we could choose, um, then we get y equals 1 half e to the x plus e to the negative x. And so then the chain would hang one unit above the x-axis. Now its derivative 
is the expression that we've already seen, but with a equal to one. But its second derivative is itself. So the second derivative uh, is the same as the original function. So it seems like there's some periodic nature, at least to the derivatives. And that reminds us of the trig functions. And so that's one of the reasons why we call these hyperbolic trigonometric functions. The hyperbolic sine function is defined as one half times the quantity e to the power of x minus e to the power of negative x. And we write that as, well, instead of putting the h in front, we put it after the sign, sine hyperbolic. And we pronounce that as cinch. I know there's no c there, but it is just convention. We, call, we say cinch of x equals one half quantity e to the x minus e to the negative x. And this is what its graph looks like. It continues, its domain is all real numbers and its range is all real numbers. The hyperbolic cosine function is our uh, hanging chain. It is one half e to the x plus e to the negative x. And we call that, or we use, say cosh. So this is hyperbolic cosine, but it looks like cosh and we pronounce it cosh as if it were a sh sound. And its graph is exactly the hanging chain. And the uh, hanging chain function uh, is also called a catenary. Catenary comes from the Latin word for chain, catenary. Then we can also define the other hyperbolic trig functions using cinch and cosh. So the hyperbolic tangent function would be the ratio cinch of x over cosh of x, and we pronounce that tanch of x. And its graph looks like the arctangent function, but it has different horizontal asymptotes, and it, has, it does have a different shape, but it certainly reminds us of the inverse tangent function graph. And of course, we could do hyperbolic secant as being uh, one over cosh of x. We pronounce that sech of x. The hyperbolic cosecant would be one over sinch of x. And we say cosech. And the hyperbolic cotangent of x would be cosh of x over sinch of x or one over tanch of x. And we actually say cough, cough of x there. So we're going to look at some of the properties of these functions in a separate video.